Well, as Pastor Brian read to you earlier in the service, on that Sunday morning following the death of Jesus and the burial of Jesus, a group of his female disciples went to the tomb to treat the body with spices. And among those women was Mary Magdalene. Now, as her name suggests, Mary was from the town of Magdala, right on the Sea of Galilee, right in the region where um, most of Jesus' ministry took place. And history has come to say that um, Mary was a prostitute before Jesus met her, but the biblical record doesn't suggest that. However, it is clear that Mary had a sordid past one that included demon possession of all things. But whatever her ugly past was, Jesus had freed her from that past. That past was long gone. She was a changed person, and she became a faithful disciple, a faithful follower of Jesus. In fact, while his male disciples were in hiding, fearing for their lives, fearing that they would be the authority's next target, she was there to the end. Even after his death, even after the death of her beloved teacher, she remained faithful to him, going with the women, the other women, to the tomb to honor him by treating his body with these spices. But as the women walked up to the tomb, they found the stone that had been the heavy stone that had been rolled in front of the entrance was now rolled away. And even more disturbing, his body was gone. A strange man told them that he had risen from the dead. Not quite sure what to do with this information, the women went back into Jerusalem and told the male disciples what they had seen and heard. Mary then returned with two of them, Peter and presumably John. And when they arrived at the tomb, Peter and John found the tomb, just as the women had described. But they couldn't figure out what was going on any more than the women could. So Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, and Mary stayed behind, weeping at the entrance to the tomb. Imagine what was going through her mind in that moment. What was going on? What had happened to Jesus' body? And what was this business about him rising from the dead? Was this some cruel joke giving them false hope in the face of their mourning? And then Jesus heard, Mary heard, a man behind her say, Woman, why are you crying? Mary didn't turn around, but she replied to the man, They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. When the man asked who she was looking for, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. You see, even in the midst of all of this confusion, even after he's dead and buried, even after all of this confusion with his body disappearing, Mary is remaining faithful. Even when she doesn't get what's going on, even when she doesn't have all the answers, she is still being faithful. And then this man standing behind her says her name, Mary. Suddenly she turns around and faces this man who's been talking with her, recognizing that voice, and she says, teacher, because this man who had been standing behind her speaking with her was none other than Jesus himself, alive and well. Her beloved teacher, the one that she thought was gone forever, was standing there in front of her, and she was overcome by a joy that she did not expect to have that morning. When Jesus finally managed to calm her down, he sent her to tell the other disciples what she had seen. Many times, even the most faithful among us go through seasons of confusion, 
seasons of doubt, seasons where we don't know where God is or what He's doing, seasons when we don't have all the answers. But if we remain faithful through those times, if we continue to be faithful, consistent followers of Jesus, just like Mary was, Jesus will surprise us. We will experience a joy that we did not expect. A little bit later that same day, a couple of Jesus' male disciples uh, left Jerusalem and headed to the town of Emmaus. As they were walking along, they were discussing the events of the last couple of days, about how they had staked their hope in Jesus, about how they had believed that He was the hope of Israel, the one who would redeem God's people. But then he had been killed, humiliated and publicly executed, and he was dead. Their hopes had been dashed. God had let them down. They were disappointed with God. And as they were having this conversation, a stranger walking along the same road overheard their conversation and joined in. And he explained to them, that the Old Testament anticipated and predicted that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise again, that this was the very thing that they should expect from the Messiah. They were so fascinated with this man that was walking with them along the road that when they finally reached Emmaus, they invited him to stay for the night. That night at dinner, they shared a meal together, and this stranger took bread from the table, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to these disciples, and then suddenly, as if blinders were open, they recognized who they had been talking to, none other than Jesus himself. And the moment they recognized him, he was gone. These disciples had been in a place of disappointment, disenfranchisement with God, disillusionment with God. They may have felt like he had let them down. But Jesus had been with them through that time. And in the end, he brought them to a place of renewed hope. You may have felt disappointed by God, let down by your faith, maybe even burned by the church. But today, I want to tell you that Jesus is walking with you through those doubts, through those disappointments, and He will bring you to a place of renewed hope. Do you ever find it hard to believe? Do you ever find it hard to have faith? You know, one of the disciples was known for his doubt. He was known for his questioning. That, that disciple was, was Thomas. Uh, Thomas had been among the disciples traveling with Jesus for, for the past three years, and yet he found it hard to, to believe. He, he doubted. He, he had questions. You know, the story of Thomas is documented in uh, John chapter 20. It was on the, the day of resurrection. It was on the first day of the week. Jesus had, had been raised from the dead that morning, and and on that evening, it says a group of the disciples were, had locked themselves in a room. Now, many scholars believe that the disciples had locked themselves in the upper room uh, where they had had the Last Supper with Jesus. And as they had, had locked themselves in, in a room to, together, it wasn't because they were afraid that Jesus was going to find them. No, they were locked themselves in, in the room because they were afraid that the uh, the Roman authorities might come after them and, and that they might experience the same punishment that, that Jesus experienced. Well, as the disciples were, were locked in this room fearful, you know, it says that Jesus came to them on, on that night. He came to them in that room and, and he said to them, peace be with you. He showed them the wounds in, in his hands and the, the, the hole in, in his side. To, to show them that indeed it, it was Jesus and, and he had been resurrected from the dead. Now, we don't know how many of the disciples were actually gathered in that room that night, but what we do know is that Thomas was not there. 
And Thomas you know, was not there, but the, some of the disciples who were told him what happened told him that they had experienced the resurrected Jesus. And, and Thomas said, I, I won't believe until I can put my finger in, in the nail holes. I won't believe until I can put my hand in, in his side. Even though these were, were trusted friends, Thomas couldn't quite believe the, the story they were telling him, the, the testimony that, that they were giving. You know, this week, Bootsy and I celebrated our, our 24th wedding anniversary, and, and on Monday night, we went, went out to eat, and we went to, to see a movie. We, we went to see the, the movie uh, Miracle from Heaven, and uh, as, we, as we watched that movie, it's the story of a, a little girl who has a disease that uh, is believed to, to be terminal. They don't know how long she's going to live, but uh, you know, expect that, that her illness is eventually going to, to take her life. And uh, as the parents are dealing with the, their daughter's illness, they go to church one day and, and some well-intending Christians, well, maybe not well-intending, maybe more like, you know, the, the people that just didn't get it, you know, showed very little compassion and they, they went to, to the mother and said, you know, this must be happening to your daughter because of, of some sin that you or, or your husband's committed. Or, or maybe your, your little girl has done something so bad that, that God is punishing her. And, and you know, with all that the family had been going through, it was, was so difficult. And, and that just uh, added more, more challenges, more, more pain to their already difficult situation. Well, the, you know, as the story goes on, the, the, the little girl experiences a miracle and, and she's healed. And uh, following the little girl being healed, the, the mother stands up in, in church and, uh, and shares a testimony of what God has done, what God has brought them through, and, and how God has worked. And, and after she had finished sharing the testimony, uh, one of those people that had, had talked to, to the mother uh, weeks or months earlier and, and condemning them for their sin, you know, one of them spoke up and, and said, oh, well, she must not have been as sick as you led us to believe. And instantly at that moment, without thinking, Bootsy blurts out, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I put my hand on her knee and said, it's, it's all right. <laughs> but when we hear a testimony of, of what God has done, you know, how many of us doubt? How many question? There may be some of us that say, you've got to be kidding. Why can't you believe what it is that, that God has done? While others will, will question and, and doubt. You know, when it came to, to Thomas, he couldn't believe the, the testimony that was being told him, the story that was being told to him from, from the other disciples. He said, I've got to see it for myself. And you know what? Jesus met Thomas at his point of struggle. You know, Jesus didn't scold him. He didn't belittle him. But Jesus met Thomas where he was. Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, continues to do that today. We may have questions. We may have doubts. And yet, even in our questions and, and doubts, Jesus will come and meet us at our very point of need. You know, there's a fourth encounter of, of the resurrected Jesus that we want to talk about briefly this morning. And, and that fourth encounter is Jesus' encounter with Peter. Now, Peter walked away from Jesus. Peter had, had denied Jesus. It was an issue that... Uh, Peter had said to, to Jesus, you know, I'll never leave you. The other disciples, they may leave you, but I will never turn my back. I will be willing to, to, to die with you. But you'll remember in, in the upper room that night, Jesus said to, to Peter, you know, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Well, as Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, all the disciples fled, and the, the story tells us that that. Uh, Peter followed those who had arrested Jesus into the courtyard of, of Caiaphas. 
And they're under the cover of darkness and, and uh, gathering around you know, campfires to, to stay warm. On three different occasions, Peter was, was questioned. Peter was asked, aren't you one of his disciples? Aren't you one of his followers? Didn't I see you with him? And in each time, Peter denies knowing Jesus. You know, I don't think Peter thought anything about what he was saying at, at that point. You know, he was just trying to protect himself because he thought uh, you know, he might be in danger of, of the same thing that, that Jesus was experiencing. I don't think Peter thought anything about his denials with each time becoming more passionate, becoming more intense. But when the rooster crowed, I've got to believe that at that point, Peter must have melted. You know, Peter is saying that that very thing that he said would, would never happen, that very thing that he, he would never do, he did. Thinking when Peter heard the, the rooster crow, he, he must have been broken at, at that point. You know, there's a, an insurance commercial on that, uh, that I like. It it's, uh, shows a, a bachelor who, who's enjoying his single life, and he says, I'm never going to get married, and in the next scene, there's a, an engagement ring. And then he and his wife are on an airplane, and there's a screaming kid sitting behind them. And, and he says, we're never going to have children. And in the next scene, she's in labor. And then, you know, they're never going to move to the suburbs. They're never going to have a minivan. They're, they're never going to have a, another child. But all of the things that he says is never going to, to happen, happens. You know, I learned a lot in seminary, but most of it was kind of general knowledge that I can't tell you, you know, where I learned it or what class it, w it was taught. But um, there are a few things that I specifically remember from a specific professor in a specific class. And one of those was in uh, my pastoral counseling class, which the professor warned us. He said, never think that you will hear of, the, of a sin that that someone has committed or, or that someone will confess to you. Never you'll be aware of someone else's sin and say to yourself, I'd never do that. Because he said, but for the grace of God, it could be you. Peter denied Jesus. You know, Peter walked away, but, but Jesus never gave up on Peter. On that first Easter, when the women came to the tomb, the women were given instructions to go and tell Peter and the other disciples. Jesus hadn't given up on, on Peter. In John chapter 21, there's a story of the resurrected Jesus encountering, encountering Peter and, and some of the other disciples fishing. And Jesus reinstates Peter. Jesus welcomes Peter back. Jesus tells Peter to feed his lambs. Peter is to take care of the flock. Just as Peter needed to experience Jesus' words of reinstatement, there's someone this morning that needs to hear that, that same truth. No matter what you've done, no matter how far you've roamed, there's a way back to the Father. And that way back to the Father is through faith in Jesus. After Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples on several occasions over the next 40 days, at one time appearing to as many as 500 of them at one time. During one of these occasions, during one of these visits with his disciples, Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, when Jesus was obedient unto death, the Father rewarded him not only by raising him back to life, but by also giving him authority over all that was and all that is. The world and everything in it belongs to Jesus. The world and everything in it belongs to God's kingdom. But it need, needed to be claimed for him. 
And the big difference between God's kingdom and the kingdom of human beings is that God's kingdom doesn't spread through force or through violence, but through changed hearts, changed lives, changed people who then become agents of change in this world, bringing about God's kingdom, helping it to spread. That is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to be a person who commits himself or herself to being changed, transformed into the person whom God created you to be. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ does mean eternal life, the promise of eternal life and the confidence that death isn't the end for us. But being a disciple of Jesus Christ, being part of the kingdom of God, isn't just a then thing, it's a right now thing. Being part of the kingdom of God, being a disciple of Jesus Christ, is allowing ourselves to be transformed, to become new people, and then to be God's agents of change in this world by being a people who, where there is hatred, we sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. That is how God's kingdom spreads. And that is the invitation of Easter to become a changed person and to be an agent of change in this world. That is how God's kingdom spreads, and that is what the resurrection of Jesus Christ means for us all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for sending your Son, not only to take our penalty on the cross, to be a sacrifice for sin, but also for his resurrection, that we might have the confidence of eternal life, and so that we might no longer fear death. But more than that, God, we thank you for the invitation to become disciples of Jesus Christ, to become changed, transformed into the people you created us to be, and then your agents of change to bring hope, joy, love, compassion, everything that you are to this world that desperately needs you. God, we thank you for this invitation to be your agents of change. And God, we pray that we might be moved by your Spirit and changed by your Spirit to carry out your mission in this world. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.